Hi, my name is Stephanie Hertz, Marketing Director here at Workforce Retirement Community. Workforce is the premier sponsor for Lifelong Learning Society, and we welcome you to the Riverside Lecture Series. Today, I have the privilege of introducing Christina Burgi. Christina Burgi is a geriatric assessment nurse with the Riverside Center of Excellence in Aging and Lifelong Health, and is a certified wound, ostomy, and continence nurse. Mrs. Burgi earned her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Shenandoah University in 2008. She is experienced in wound, ostomy, and continence care, and has worked in outpatient clinics and acute care settings. She enjoys educating healthcare staff and the community in each of her specialties. Mrs. Burgi is an approved clinical skills instructor for the Wound, Ostomy, and Continence Nurse Society's Wound Treatment Associate Program. She previously taught for the Riverside Health System's Wound Treatment Associate Program as well. She and her family reside in Suffolk, Virginia. Please give a warm welcome to Christina as she speaks about a preventative approach to skin and wound care. All right, hello, good morning, everybody. My name is Christina Berge, and CNU is going to take a minute uh, to honor our veterans um, and thank you for your service and your support for our country and all of us. So let's take a minute, please. All right, good morning. As I stated earlier, my name is Christina Berge and I am thrilled and so happy to be here to share with you all uh, online and here present uh, on a topic that I am so passionate about, um, skin and wound care. I would like to tell you a little bit about myself. So I am a certified wound ostomy and continence nurse. I'm blessed to be the geriatric assessment nurse for the Center of Excellence in Aging and Lifelong Health. Um, and so we are here to uh, educate um, on many topics, but today will be skin and wound care. Um, I uh, am certified as a wound ostomy and continence, uh, continence nurse, but I graduated from Shenandoah University. I have worked in both acute care settings and outpatient settings. I love both, um, but I have many years of experience in skin and wound care. Um, a lot of this presentation today is going to be based on questions that I've had if I would have only known. So I have titled this uh, presentation today, A Preventative Approach to Skin and Wound Care, because that's our goal. We want to prevent before things happen. And a lot of patients have said, uh, patients and caregivers, if I would have only known. So that is what this um, presentation is based on today. All right, so we'll get started here this morning. All right, so to talk about skin and wound care, it's important to think about the anatomy of the skin and the different aspects of the skin. So skin is the largest organ of the body. Being the largest organ of the body, it's important to know that intact skin is the first line of defense from environmental threats. Let's talk about three important skin layers. The first one is the epidermis. What is the epidermis? The epidermis is the thin outer layer of the skin. It contains no blood vessels. So we call that clinically avascular. There's no blood vessels present. Regenerates every four to six weeks. That's about every 28 days. 
The function is to protect the skin from um, external threats, um, external and internal, um, and control of water loss through the epidermis. And so it helps to seal in the body's moisture. The second layer is the dermis. So the dermis is the second layer and that contains a network of blood vessels. So those blood vessels are now protected by the epidermis. Um, nerve endings are present, sweat and sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands are our oil producing glands, um, lymphatics and hair follicles. What is its function? Tensile strength, and we'll get into that and in some slides to come. We'll talk about that strength and the different proteins that help and add to that strength. Moisture retention, nourishment to the skin, so that's our blood and oxygen being provided, and to protect the underlying structures, which are our muscles, our bones, and our organs. Secrete sebum, so again, that's the oil from those sebaceous glands, and to moisturize and acidify the skin. And a couple of slides to come, we're gonna talk about the pH of the skin and our acid mantle of the skin. And we'll kind of break those apart too. In order to understand how to protect our skin, we need to know the different aspects of our skin. Uh, all of those work together hand in hand. So the overall functions of the skin are to protect, thermoregulation, communication, metabolism, and sensation. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next slide here. All right, so there are intrinsic and extrinsic aspects of the skin. Intrinsic, that is the non-modifiable, not able to change aspects of our skin, which are things like our age, pre-existing skin disorders, chronic, and or acute health conditions. Extrinsic, which are modifiable. That's what we're gonna talk about today. There are things that we can change, such as our fluid, our diet, our lifestyle, and our skincare practices. All of those aspects are very, very important. Next slide. Okay, so we were talking about that tensile strength. Let's talk about two very important proteins that are within our dermis. So we have our collagen and we have the elastin. As you see here in the graphic present, we see with our younger skin, all of those areas and molecules are lined up nicely. That's the way that our bodies are made so that they can regenerate and help us throughout our life um, cycle. Now, as we age, you see some of those molecules have broken apart. So we need to take care of our skin and different factors as moisturizing, cleansing, um, they all add to protecting the collagen and the elastin. So we need to start thinking about how to protect our skin, which we will do here. Um, but the collagen is the shape and the structural support of our skin. The elastin, is the ability of our skin to retain its shape. So those two work hand in hand and are very important. All right, I'm gonna go to the next slide here. So now the pH of the skin. What does that have to do with our skin? It has so much to do with our skin and it is very, very important. Um, there's different types of skin damage that can occur due to moisture and it changes the pH of our skin. Now, acid mantle. What is the acid mantle? It's a thin film with a slightly acidic pH on the surface of the skin that provides protection, overall protection for our skin. Factors that can affect the pH of our skin are acne, air pollution, change in season, so humidity levels, cosmetics that we choose, detergents, our sebum, how much oil that our skin produces or lacks to produce, or skin moisture, sweat, and excessive sun exposure. The overall um, of the pH of the skin is to help keep the moisture in 
and protects the skin from bacterial, fungal infections, and damage. So I know we all think back to high school and we learned about alkaline versus acidic nature. So we don't want alkaline. We want to stay from, away from those alkaline natures. We want our skin to be a more acidic nature so that it helps to naturally fight off skin infections, fungal infections. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here in the slides to come. All right, and next slide. So a part of what I do as being a wound care nurse is preventing pressure injuries. That is a huge aspect. For the hospital, it's a huge aspect because we want to try to prevent hospital acquired pressure injuries. We don't want to create pressure injuries. So we as wound care nurses, it's our goal to make sure that we're assessing skin. Now, being that we are clinicians, that's what we do. But being as a, you know, as a caregiver, uh, being as a patient, we need to be aware of our skin and take time to do skin inspections. Now, pressure injury, it's a localized damage to the skin and underlying soft tissue. Usually, and that definition has changed. It used to always be always over a bony prominence. Now it's not always. It's, it's come to been found that pressure injuries can be from other things. We'll break apart definitions of each one of the stages in just a minute. Um, or related to a medical device, um, a medical or other device. So a pressure injury seriously affects the quality of life in many ways. Symptoms can include pain, drainage, infections, odors, and more. So what is our goal? To improve quality of life, our quality of life, or for caregivers to help improve their loved one's quality of life. Skin microclimate, and we'll get into that too, and I'll break apart those definitions, but it's a term used to describe the interaction between the skin temperature and moisture at the skin surface. When the skin is wet, the skin becomes softer and more permeable, and the pH of the skin moves away from its normal acidic range into an alkaline state. So what I think about is when we sit in a bathtub and our fingers get a little pruny, Okay, well that's normal because we get wet and our skin kind of absorbs some of that water. But if that moisture remains on the skin for a long period of time, we can then get wounds because it damages the pH uh, of the skin, that natural acidic range um, of the skin. In April of 2016, the National Pressure Injury Advisory Panel updated the naming, the naming of pressure-related skin issues from pressure ulcers. And those of us who are uh, nurses or physicians um, online or clinicians, we used to hear decubitus ulcers all the time. And we still see that, um, decubitus ulcers, no longer called decubitus ulcers, no longer called ulcers to make it more um, exact of what it is because a stage one pressure injury is not an opening of the skin. It's not an ulcer ulcer. So it's now an injury, no longer pressure ulcer. It's important to know how to properly name and term um, wounds. Um, so pressure injuries are sometimes referred to as decubitus ulcers or bed sores, but this is no longer the proper terminology. Next slide. Okay. So blanchable versus non-blanchable. So either ourselves or loved ones. I know many of us have had surgeries and so we're lying in the bed. We may be in pain, but it's still important to move. If we're in the same position for a long period of time, that pressure on a bony area or on a bed, or if we're in a wheelchair can create a pressure injury. So as clinicians, what we do is we check to see if the skin is blanchable versus non-blanchable. You see in this graphic here. So what you do is, is you touch the reddened area of the skin. If it changes to a white and then changes back to a red, that means there's vascularization in that area. That's what we want to see. 
if we touch it in this other graphic and it remains that red color, that's when we say, oh no, this is a pressure injury. So at that early stage, we try to protect it and we put offloading measures on that area, which we will talk about some offloading measures that we can use. Um, but that's the primary way that we check is blanchable versus non-blanchable. All right, next slide. So in talking about the stages, I could talk about the stages all day long, but I'm gonna give a brief description of each one of these so that we are aware. Again, this whole presentation is about prevention. If we don't know, how do we prevent? So I would like to discuss today about the different stages. So as you see in this graphic here, actually the first and the second uh, is a stage one pressure injury. A stage one is intact skin with localized area of non-blanchable erythema, which may appear differently in darkly pigmented skin. So as you see here, we have the lightly pigmented and we have the darkly pigmented. One kind of, it looks more red. Uh, this one looks a little bit more purple, almost a maroon. So it's important to see that there are differences in the appearance of that stage one. Now, when you get to a stage two, the wound bed is viable. It's pink or red, moist, may also present as an intact or ruptured serum filled blister. So we see a blister. It may be on the sacrum. We think, oh, it's a blister. It actually is a pressure injury at that point. So we wanna protect it and offload it. Um, that is a primary term that we like to use to redistribute that pressure and prevent um, either the wound, the pressure injury getting worse um, or to prevent um, infection. So keeping the pressure off of that area. All right, the next stage is a stage three pressure injury. And the stage three, as you see here, is the last one on the top here. And as you see, it's a little bit deeper. Typically, they're a little bit larger. There are more chronic, not so much acute. So it's something that's been there for a little while in which the adipose, so the fat tissue is present at that point is visible in the ulcer and granulation tissue. So the granulation tissue, that's a big word for just pink tissue that's present in the wound. So you'll see it looks almost like little bubbles that are present on the wound. Um, and also it just typically because it's chronic, it shows as a pibbly. So there's what we called rolled edges. So it begins to falsely seal and close so that it can't heal. We want the edges of the wound to contract inward to heal. So it's almost like you think of a wound and it can't go uphill. It's got to go straight across. But if it has falsely sealed off edges, it's not going to close. So in clinical, what we would do is we would take a silver nitrate stick. We would open up those edges that are epibole so that it can eventually close. Sometimes we'll see hypergranulated tissue. So tissue that causes that mountain and then the edges of the wound are down here and that can't close either. So we'd have to use again, like a silver nitrate stick to take off that hypergranulated tissue and to even it out so that those edges can contract inwards and close. Now, a stage four pressure injury, as you see down below, is now with exposed or directly palpable fascia, muscle, tendon, ligament, cartilage, or bone in the ulcer. So when I think of a stage four and I see bone, I think of osteomyelitis, infection in the bone. So we have to try to prevent that from spreading. So that's one thing that we try to investigate and explore very quickly when we see that there's a stage four pressure injury. So of course, prevention, we don't want it to happen to begin with. So we try to prevent it from progressing. All right, so the next one here is a deep tissue pressure injury. So a lot of times we see these on the heels. Heels will look purple and it's almost like a blood filled blister. Now, 
Yes, we want our loved ones or, or as being caregivers or ourselves. You know, if we're in pain, we don't want to move. But what we can do is make sure that we're inspecting the skin. We can elevate those heels off the bed with pillows um, and just making sure that we're turning and repositioning, keeping pressure off of those areas. Um, but the deep tissue is intact or non-intact skin with localized area of persistent, non-blanchable, uh, deep red maroon, kind of purple discolored, or epidermal separation, revealing a dark wound bed or blood-filled blister. Unstageable pressure injury. So that is this one here in the middle. It is just that. We can't stage it at this point. There is so much what we call eschar, which is dead tissue, or slough, which is also dead tissue, slough presents as yellow, that we can't clinically stage it. So we call it unstageable pressure injury. So when we see unstageables, it's a full thickness skin and tissue loss at this point, in which the extent of tissue damage within the injury cannot be confirmed uh, because it's obscured by slough or eschar. Now, there are two others here, mucosal membrane, um, pressure injury and medical uh, device related. So mucosal membrane injury is found on the mucous membranes with a history of medical device. So sometimes we'll find nasal cannulas and then you lift and you see a pressure injury that was caused from the pressure of that medical device. So ICU patients, we have to make sure we're monitoring all of these areas, looking underneath, making sure there's not a medical device that's causing a pressure injury. And um, then we also have, so the mucosal membrane is the moist um, inner lining of some organs and body cavities. So uh, just to define what the mucosal membrane is, and then of course, um, medical device related. So making sure that our patients are, um, devices are being rotated, um, being um, visualized underneath and moved and not in the same position for a long period of time. All right, so next slide here. All right, so pressure injury prevention points. So in November, November 17th, this is a huge day for us to educate and just say in, in general, to be aware, stop pressure injuries. So we all need reminders at some point in time. Um, so pressure injury prevention points are bed fast and chair fast individuals are higher risk for development of pressure injuries. So being aware of your skin, movement and positioning. So that third Thursday in November every year, that's the day that I am educating, telling healthcare staff and remembering that this is something that needs to stop. We need to stop pressure injuries. We need to uh, be aware of what they are. Um, so this is my goal. All right. So I've been talking about offloading, pressure redistribution. So these are the common sites that we see pressure injuries. The heels, tailbone, elbows, shoulder blades, the back of the head between the ankles, outer ankles, between the knees, outer knees, hip bones, shoulders, and ears. So being mindful, me as a clinician to do a full body skin assessment when I'm walking into a patient's room. If they lay on one side, if they've had a stroke and they have weakness on one side, all of these are very important points for us as clinicians to think about so that we can prevent pressure injuries. But these are the most common sites of pressure injuries. Now, as you see in the graphic here, there's two different products that I love. So these are wedges that can be used. We can use them on ourselves. Our caregivers can use them. Um, and then repositioning wedges, or um, sheets, excuse me. They help us to pull up our loved one in the bed. We want to try to prevent that friction and that shearing effect, which we're gonna talk about and we'll define in just a minute. But it helps us to move our loved one or ourselves without creating like a rug burn effect. Now, 
the wedges, if we have a wound already, we're having a hard time with turning and repositioning and we're in pain, we can use a wedge to keep the pressure off of that area and then rotate it to another side to keep the pressure off the other area. So this is our goal to redistribute the pressure and alleviate the, the blood flow and the oxygen. We, we want to increase the blood flow and the oxygen, so we want to alleviate the pressure from those areas. But these are two wonderful products that you can get. They're available on Amazon. Um, they're available. These are Medline Comfort Glide Sheets. Um, and the other, actually the wedges are Medline also, and that's a great product um, to use. All right, so we talked about shear and friction. Friction is surface resistance relative to motion as a body is sliding or rolling and the rubbing of the surface of one body against that of another. So rug burn is what we think of with that. Now, it's not pressure at that friction point. Shear is now thinking about pre pressure. So we think about pressure injuries when we look at shear um, wounds, but it incorporates two forces. So we've got the friction and another force, which is gravity uh, leading to pressure injuries or inertia leading to trauma injuries. So this graphic, and it's hard to find now, but I'm so glad I saved it when I did. As you see, we have the gravity and then we have the friction effect. So, and that, if it's occurring all the time, can create a wound. So we have to be careful to lift up our loved ones or ourselves to prevent that. You know, if we're in a wheelchair to prevent the, the rubbing and the sliding, especially on our backside, or if we have our feet um, in the, the feet um, protectors, we have to make sure we're moving them around because that pressure can cause a wound down here um, in our lower extremities. So that's important. Keeping in mind too, so we have our body weight, tight bedding. We want to be nice and warm, but sometimes that can cause pressure on these heels if we don't loosen those sheets. So all these things kind of work together hand in hand and keeping them in mind to keep our skin healthy. And then we have that friction effect. All right. Okay, I have had so many questions about skin tears. How do I prevent them? Where do I get them? So this whole portion is gonna be about skin tears, how to prevent them, how to treat them. Um, a skin tear is a type of wound that is caused by friction and shear as we just uh, discussed or blunt trauma resulting in the division of skin layers. As you see here, this one is actually a nice looking skin tear. We still have a skin flap. So what is the goal if we have a skin flap present? I've had people say, should I cut it off? No, we wanna keep that skin flap intact. So you wanna clean the area and you wanna gently roll that skin flap down so that it can heal and it will heal so much faster. Skin tears typically heal in about seven to 21 days depending on the depth, how deep that skin tear is. Different factors that can affect it are age, newborns, elderly. Skin is thinner. and newborns, it's still developing. Elderly, skin is thinner. So we have to be more cognizant of that and how to protect it. Chronic illness and long-term steroid use um, can um, increase the risk. Steroids can thin our skin. So keeping all of those things um, in mind. All right, skin tear prevention. How do we prevent that from happening? You wanna make sure your home is well lit. So those sensor lights are wonderful. So if you can place them in corners, in the hallway, where your bathroom is, making sure that rugs and things are secured on the floor so that there's no slipping or falling, making sure that your path is well lit, remove any furniture or objects that block a clear path, 
especially around the bed and on the way to the bathroom. Padding sharp corners of furniture with foam or folded cloth to soften the corners. Now I do this with my kids. I found all these foam corners and they're everywhere. So I'm probably just gonna leave them up there, but they are wonderful and they're easy to find. I found mine on Amazon, but you can find um, foam um, you know, for, for your corners of your furniture pieces. And it is so smart to do that. Um, and removing your dressings carefully, um, and I'll get it, uh, into how to remove them. But the reason I wanna show you and have a graphic on how to remove dressings is because if you remove it the wrong way, it's gonna open that skin flap again so that it has to heal all over again. So I'll get into that in just a minute. Using a non-adherent dressing. So we have heard about Telfa dressings that we can buy from Walgreens or Walmart or um, Petrolatum um, kind of impregnated in gauze. So it creates a non-stick and you just put that right on top. But I'll show you here some graphics to come, but something that's not gonna stick when you do remove it to assess it. Skin tear treatment, so control the bleeding. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna hold pressure on that area until the bleeding has stopped. You wanna gently clean the wound with warm, clean water or sterile, normal saline which we can get from Walgreens, Rite Aid, Walmart, um, and gently pat dry. We discussed this already. If the skin flap is still attached, try to replace it by gently the ro rolling the skin back over the wound. Do not cut the skin flap off. Cover the wound with a clean nonstick pad, so petroleum gauze. So what my habit is, is keeping some of this stockinette in your house is valuable. It is a, just a regular kind of stockinette that you can buy online. Um, it's an elastic net sleeve. And so when you want to search it, you just say stockinette elastic net sleeve. But that's so we don't have to put tapes on our skin or band-aids and we're going to create another skin tear. So what you want to do is take a nonstick pad after you've cleaned it, put it on top of the skin tear. Then... If, this, you know, if it's still bleeding, you wanna have some four by four gauze. All of this you could get over the counter, but I just, I like to say ahead of time, it's good to keep it in your home so that you're ready if something is to occur. But you wanna put the four by four gauze. Then you put that stock in it over that area to hold it in place. And it's easy to assess. You don't have to put a Band-Aid and open that area, you know, again and again. Now, we talked about going over the instructions of how to remove the dressings. So when removing the dressings, make sure to pull it off in the same direction as the skin flap. So in the picture we just saw, the skin flap goes like this and you roll it back down over the wound. So we're gonna remove the dressing like that. We're not gonna remove the dressing coming this way because it's gonna open up that skin tear all over again. So that is just one of the main kind of star points that I like to educate on um, to prevent that skin tear from opening again. Moisture. All right, so we talked about the pH of the skin. This first one here is called intertrigenous dermatitis. It's a long word or intertrigo, of basically saying sweat. So it's moisture in our folds. So underneath our armpits, axilla, the abdomen, between the fingers, um, behind the knee, between the toes. A little secret I like to say for between the toes. A lot of people think, oh, it's a fungus. A lot of times it's just intertrigenous dermatitis. Keeping you know, like those pedicure separators of the toes, walking around with those for a couple days in your home to let your toes air out will get rid of that intertrigenous dermatitis in between the toes but before it turns into a fungus. But it's caused by moisture in between the skin folds and friction, so that rubbing of the opposing skin folds. And as you see here, this one has what we call some satellite lesions. So it actually has some fungus that is, um, good morning, that is mixed in here too. 
So if we see some fungus, I do recommend that seeing a primary care provider is very important because they can give you a prescription, an antifungal to help treat that also. Um, we'll get into some skin barriers because what you want to do, of course, is to keep those areas dry. You're going to pat them dry um, throughout the day. Typically, if you keep those areas dry, you don't need anything further. But say if it's still red, you're patting dry, you do want a thin kind of barrier cream to put on those areas to help it to heal completely. And we'll get into that in just a minute. Incontinence. It's a subject that we don't like to talk about, but it's a part of life and many of us have it. This graphic here, I think sums it up the best. Hello, incontinence helpline, can you hold? No, sometimes we can't hold. So there's two different types. There's fecal and there's urinary. Urinary incontinence is more prevalent. So we're gonna discuss urinary uh, today. Over 25 million adult Americans experience urinary incontinence. So it's very common. It occurs at any age, but it's more common among women over the age of 50. And incontinence is nothing to be ashamed of. Um, healthcare professionals and specialists can provide treatments or products to help treat and protect from further complications caused by incontinence. Okay, so this is the step-by-step -step of urinary incontinence and the different types. I thought it would be important today to go through each one. Um, then you can kind of identify either which one affects you or a loved one, or just to be aware of in general. The first is transient incontinence. It's just that. It's temporary. Situation goes away, such as if you have an infection or start a new uh, medication. Once that cause is removed, the incontinence goes away. So that's great with that one. Is, but the main goal is to identify what is causing the transient incontinence. The next one is stress incontinence. Happens when stress or pressure on your bladder causes you to leak. Coughing, sneezing, laughing, lifting something heavy can cause it. Um, so the primary causes of that are, are a weak pelvic floor. We'll talk about um, pelvic floor too with physical therapy. There are physical therapists that special, specialize with pelvic floor muscle training to help strengthen those muscles. But we'll discuss that in just a minute. But as being a continence nurse, I like to hit those bases so that you're aware. Urge incontinence happens when you have a strong urge, just as the term states, you have that urge, you need to urinate, and some urine leaks out before you can make it to the toilet. It's often related to an overactive bladder. Urge incontinence is most common in older people. It can sometimes be a sign of urinary tract infection. It can also happen in some neurological conditions, such as multiple sclerosis, and spinal cord injuries. Overflow incontinence happens when your bladder doesn't empty all the way. So your bladder actually overflows. This causes too much urine to stay in your bladder. Your bladder gets too full and so therefore you leak urine. This form of urinary incontinence is most common in men. Some of the causes include tremors, kidney stones, diabetes, and certain medications. Functional, functional incontinence, and actually a lot of these terms, it describes it just by what it's identified as. Happens when you have a physical or a mental disability, trouble speaking, or some other problem keeps you from getting to the toilet in time. For example, someone with arthritis may have trouble unbuttoning his or her pants, or a person with Alzheimer's disease may not realize that they need to plan to use the toilet. So there's incontinence. And then the last one, but not least, is mixed incontinence. It means that you have more than one type of incontinence. It's usually a combination of stress and urge incontinence together. So that's mixed incontinence. 
So treatment of urinary incontinence. Number one is discuss with your primary care physician. They may or may not, or if you already have a urologist, they may refer you to a urologist for best treatment options. What is this thing here? This is a bladder diary. These are wonderful, and you can keep one on your own. This bladder diary is typically four to a week days that you would keep what you, how much you drink, what you drink, um, you know, as far as, you know, did you urinate and your habits. But this bladder diary, and you can go online and find these and print these off, is a great way for your primary care provider to best treat you um, in diagnosis um, and refer. So I recommend bladder diaries are a great and wonderful option. Now, options for treatment of urinary incontinence are behavioral techniques, lifestyle changes, pelvic floor, muscle exercises. So there are different exercises that you can do, but they're also, and we talked about this earlier, um, are physical therapists that are trained with the pelvic floor. And so of course, what we wanna do is least invasive to most invasive. So we wanna start with something like strengthening our muscles to be able to hold the capacity um, that it can. So I think this is a great option um, with um, you know, physical therapy for pelvic floor. Um, you know, in the beginning stages um, of treatment. Um, then also incontinence products, which I'm going to break those apart for you guys too. Um, ones that I like, when to use one versus another. So we're going to discuss that. Um, medications um, for treatment, and then medical procedures or surgeries. And that's last, okay? Last resort. Okay, so skin damage associated with incontinence. So it kind of flows into incontinence-associated dermatitis. What is it? It is caused by extended contact with urine or stool on the skin. So as you see here, we have some stool, and then we have some incontinence-associated uh, um, dermatitis there. This graphic here is showing how important it is to clean it off because if you don't, this urine is gonna seep into the skin along with the stool. It's gonna change the pH of the skin, making our skin more permeable and exposed to environmental threats. So keeping the urine and the stool off of this skin is so important. IAD commonly occurs in the groin, perineum, labial folds, the vulva, anus, posterior thighs, the scrotum, the gluteal cleft, and buttocks. IAD is often misguided as a stage one or two pressure injury. I would get commonly, you know, other clinicians or nurses, the patient has a huge pressure injury. And really it was a huge incontinence associated uh, dermatitis. So keeping a skin buried, keeping them clean, keeping an absorptive layer on the bed that's gonna wick away the urine um, you know, from the body uh, is so important. So, and, and identifying the differences between a pressure injury versus um, incontinence associated dermatitis is very important. So body-worn absorbent products. What are body-worn absorbent products? The goal for all body-worn absorbent products is to wick away moisture from the skin. Now, so many of us don't know there's so many different types. There's different colors. There's different styles. What's the best type for me? So this top one here is a disposable absorptive pull-on. It's designed to fit similar to regular underwear. As you see, it pulls right up. There are a lot of them are thin to the body, so you can't see it through your clothes, and that's important to a lot of us. Typically with the disposable absorbent pull-ons, that's gonna be those of us or a loved one that is mobile. So that's up, walking around, moving. That is very important for this one. Now, the second one is a disposable absorbed debris. That's designed for easier removal. So typically that's gonna be up, you know, those of us or 
um, a loved one that's not able to move on their own. So we're using a Velcro, Velcro strap for easier removal and to put it back on. This one down below is a disposable booster pad. Now this is the one that many of us, we don't know about. I've heard so many patients and loved ones say that, oh, I just use a menstrual pad. Do not use a menstrual pad. That's not to be used because it can't absorb as much of that liquid uh, than it needs to. So you actually do need an incontinence disposable booster pad and or guard. It's designed to pr provide additional protection in regular underwear. Um, you can put it in pull-ons or brief. Um, and again, please do not use disposable menstrual pads. Uh, they're not recommended for use with incontinence. That's very important. So when selecting products, what do we consider? I know for me, number one is comfort. We want it to be comfortable. If it itches, if it hurts, we don't want something that's uncomfortable. Containment effectiveness. So we want to look at the absorbent capacity. How much am I leaking? What times of day do I leak? Um, you want something to be able to absorb fully. Location of absorptive surface, elastication, and the elastic length gathers. All of those are different components. Odor control, number one. I hear patients, I just, I don't wanna smell. So look for something that has odor control. Skin protection, we talked about pH of the skin already. Breathability, um, there's breathable side panels. Some of them have pressure redistribution properties. So for those patients or us or loved ones, that are not able to move on their own. We want something with a pressure redistribution property within that containment, um, this, our body-worn absorbent product. Aesthetics. Yes, I think about noise. If you hear something and you're walking down the hall, you know, you wanna keep that noise to a minimum. Um, absence of rustling, low profiles, as we already discussed um, with our clothing and other aesthetic elements such as color, design and appearance. There is a website that I'd like to let you know about that is wonderful. It is called cine-usa.com. There's actually a profile that you can go on and you can say how much you're in leakage, what time of day, and it helps you to identify the different types that might be appropriate for you. Uh, for the uh, body warm absorbent product. Again, that's Cine, S-E-N-I dash U-S-A dot com. All right. Skincare products. Okay, so skin cleansers, what do they do? They remove environmental debris from the skin that could be harmful and adversely affect the pH of the skin. Most companies now will see, will say that it is, um, you know, the pH is what it's supposed to be. So you wanna look and make sure that, you know, about pH, um, does it help to keep the pH of the skin? Skin barriers, creams, and protectants. It provides protection from different types of bodily fluids. So as we talked about urine, stool, saliva, sweat, and so forth, and environmental factors, and helps retain the moisture that we have. But pH balance is very important when you're looking for a skincare um, product. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. That's a great question. So the question was, when you're wet after taking a shower, for example, when is the best time to apply a moisturizer? That would be right after your shower. So after your shower, you're coming out, damp, you know, just kind of take a towel, get you know the heavy moisture off, then go ahead and put your moisturizer on. That is a wonderful question. You do wanna dry though in between the skin folds. So in between the buttocks, um, in your axilla areas, underneath the breasts, um, you know certain areas first, um, just so you don't get too much of that product in that area. Um, but that's a great question. So right after your shower or bath. Okay, thank you for that question. That's a great one. All right. Aging and skincare products. As we age, the type of skincare products that we require may need to change. 
our skin over time begins to experience a decrease in collagen and moisture loss. The use of appropriate skin barriers and cleansers can help prevent possible skin damage. All right, next slide. All right, I think this kind of encompasses it. Just like Macaulay Culkin here, he found the wrong product. Ah! So we wanna stay away from the wrong product, but we wanna find pH balance solutions to remove contaminants, foreign debris, and exudate from the skin. Exudate is just the buildup throughout the day that we get the oil on our skin. There's specialty, specialty design cleansers for removing urine and feces. So we'll talk about that. But also there are rinse and no rinse formulas. And it's important to know those. And we'll talk about those too. The first step in the process of cleansing is moisturizing and protecting the skin. Okay, now I will talk about here. Cetaphil is a wonderful product. So that is one that is pH balanced, and I do recommend that. Another one is Aloe Vesta. So it's a foaming um, skin cleanser that can be used all over the body, actually. Um, I like to recommend this to patients, to caregivers, that you can be out and about. I always say, if there's any form of incontinence, keep an emergency bag with you. In that emergency bag, you want to have disposable washcloths. You can buy those, Amazon, you can get those from Walgreens. Amazon has everything, I know. You have to be careful sometimes with Amazon, so just make sure that it's a credible um, you know, uh, seller um, when you get something. But Amazon typically does have uh, those products, but you want a um, you know, disposable washcloth. You want something like an Aloe Vesta foaming cleanser. So say you have an incontinence episode. You go into the bathroom. In that emergency bag, you're gonna have those disposable washcloths. You're gonna do a couple pumps of that. You can cleanse on off the urine and the fecal matter, put it back into your bag and throw it away on your way out. You also wanna keep extra body-worn absorbent products in there with you and have them with you at all times. But keep them in a bag that you just, you love and you carry around and it, does, it doesn't, you know, um, it doesn't, you know, it just is a part of you. It's a part of, you can keep your other things in there too, but you want to keep those, um, you know, particular products with you so that you can throw them away and dispose of them and, uh, you know, not have a, a, a not prepared moment. We've all had not prepared moments, but we try to prepare for those moments in advance. Now, moisturizers versus moisture barrier. So we talked about both. So moisturizers are intended to hydrate the skin. The ingredients vary, but often contain water and humectants, emollients and vitamins. Barriers, that's what it's gonna do. It's gonna be a barrier against the urine and against the fecal matter um, and against irritants. So most common ingredients of moisture barriers are dimethicone, petroleum, and zinc oxide. Now, I'm saying dimethicone, petroleum, zinc oxide, because when you're buying your product, typically your skin barrier is gonna have either a couple of those or one of those products in them. I would like to discuss with you today what each one of those are. A petroleum product is gonna be on those initial, like um, a skin associated you know, dermatitis. When you don't have the open areas of the skin, we call them denuded, kind of open wounds, because that skin is so damaged. If it's not open and it's just that initial red skin irritation, find a you know, petro petrolatum product that you just put right on top. It's a thinner product. Now, if you start to have some open areas of the skin and the skin is pretty irritated, you wanna find something with a zinc oxide. That is gonna be thicker. So if you have another incontinence episode, it's gonna typically stay on there a little bit and you could clean and then put another layer of that zinc oxide to protect the wound bed and the surrounding skin. So that's what that's important for. The moisture barrier you may need will depend on the amount um, or extent of the skin damage. Now, I wanna also discuss dimethicone. Dimethicone is a silicone-based polymer used as a moisturizing skin barrier to treat or prevent dry, rough, scaly, itchy skin and minor skin irritations. So that's the one 
I hear a lot of times, what is dimethicone? Um, typically, it'll be in those petroleum-based products also. Oh, and always keep in mind too, your allergies. And if there's, um, if you don't like smells or scents, keep all of those things in mind. Um, making sure that you look at the ingredients prior to using them is very, very important. All right, quality nutrition. Proper nutrition can help support strong skin and muscles, which can help prevent pressure injuries and promote healing if a pressure injury occurs. So calories, proteins, amino acids, what are those? Arginine is a big one that we look at at wound care. And I'll talk about what that is too. So arginine is um, a conditionally essential amino acid that is critical uh, for wound healing. Um, vitamins and minerals and water. And then real quick, so adequate calories help to maintain muscle mass and weight. Protein helps repair and maintain tissue and muscles, which can help pressure injuries to heal. Um, vitamins and minerals uh, are associated with wound healing. And then a really cool fact is water, proper hydration carries nutrients throughout the body. So that's another reason to stay hydrated. That helps those nutrients to circulate throughout the entire body. So the arginine typically is over the counter. I always say before getting that, discuss that with your primary care physician. Now, typically it's recommended by primary care if there's a wound already. So if there's no wound, no arginine but I would always recommend talking to your primary care provider about it before starting. All right, we already talked about this here. I wanna kind of skip ahead because we're almost out of time. So I'm gonna skip ahead here, ostomy awareness. So I'm a wound, ostomy, and continence nurse. I wanted to just bring awareness. So ostomy is a surgery. It's a life-saving procedure that allows bodily waste to pass through a surgically created stoma on the abdomen through a prosthetic, also known as a pouch or an ostomy bag on the outside of the body or an internal surgically created pouch for continent diversion surgeries. Approximately 725,000 to 1 million people have one. So someone right next to you may have one and you don't even know it. Approximately 100,000 ostomy surgeries are performed each year in the United States. An ostomy can be temporary or it can be permanent. And there's different types. So we have a colostomy, ileostomy, and a urostomy. Large portion of the bowel, small intestine, and urine. And so I just wanted to bring about awareness of this today. Um, so colostomy is surgically created opening of the colon, which goes through the abdomen. So it's more form, uh, firm stool. Uh, normally it's located on the left lower quadrant of the abdomen. Ileostomy, surgically created opening of the small intestines, which goes through the abdomen. So it's more liquid, more enzymatic stool. So we have to be careful of what we call that peristomal skin uh, from the moisture. And then urostomy is a surgically created opening to drain urine. Now, we as clinicians, uh, ostomy certified nurses, support our surgeons. A lot of times we will do education with the patient if they have time prior to surgery. Sometimes there's acute cases that they come in and it's just so quick that we don't have time to educate prior. But if ultimately, if we have time to educate prior, we will actually mark, we do an, an uh, abdominal uh, assessment uh, we look at contours, previous um, surgical locations uh, to try to avoid those areas. And we actually will mark um, in several locations uh, where the ultimate spot is for that ostomy marking for the surgeon to bring through the stoma on the abdomen. So why ostomy awareness? I wasn't the first one to think about this. There's an ostomy awareness day that is October 1st of every year. Me, as being a certified ostomy nurse, I am blessed to be able to take classes all day, every year on that day that are offered to us that I can sit with other and have online uh, classes to learn about different ostomy treatments because they're changing all the time. 
so that we as clinicians and certified ostomy nurses um, know best how to treat. Um, reasons for ostomies, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis complications, cancers such as colorectal, bladder, cervical, and others, infections, sepsis, perforated diverticulitis, birth defect, blunt and or penetrating abdominal trauma. Um, so the goal is to reduce or eliminate negative stigmas of ostomies, to be aware because it's a part of life. A great resource if you'd like to find out more is the UOAA. That is the United Ostomy Association of America. We work very closely with them to figure out different tools and ways that we can educate our patients and have a very good partnership. All right. Right on time. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Yes, great question. The question was, I, is there any ways that, or any way that I can prevent the thinning of skin as I age? And there is. So a lot of times, I know myself previously, I used to take a shower every single day. So reducing the amount of showers that we take, um, you know, we still want to clean, but, you know, just reducing uh, the amount of exposure to the pH of our skin changing keeping a moisturizer on. Anytime we're washing our face, washing our bodies, we should be putting a moisture um, barrier on to keep our moisture in that we currently have. So yes, ma'am, there is. The best way to do that is to moisturizers, skin barriers, if we start to see damage, if we have that inner trigenous dermatitis, which is the sweat and you know the folds of our skin, keeping them dry, first step. Then if it remains red, putting on a petrolatum, petroleum, kind of base barrier, um, you know, and then if it starts to get what we saw in the picture here, those satellite lesions, so there's little dots that are around it, that's when it starts to get fungal, and we need to contact our primary care provider in regards to a prescription for that. Great question. Yes. Uh, the first question is, how would you recommend to care for 84-year-old skin that is now very thin and covers warfarin-filled interior due to blood clots? That covers what now? It says, yeah, I'm not sure either. It says very thin and covers warfarin-filled interior due to blood clots. Well, always contact your primary care provider for that last, um, what you stated lastly. I would say preventing um, or protecting your furniture around the house. We want to prevent skin tears. We want to prevent tripping, falling, um, you know, and making sure your house is well lit. But just as um, I discussed earlier, you want to have a good moisturizer that you're putting on every day to protect your skin. The next question is, what are keloids and how should they be treated? Yes. So keloids are kind of like benign uh, areas on the skin, raised areas. Um, sometimes if the keloid is large enough, um, a dermatologist can remove them. Um, so it depends on the size of the keloid. If it is something that's obstructing your quality of life, um, or if it's on an area um, that is, you know, not safe, um, such as around the neck, you know, different areas uh, you definitely want to see a primary care provider in regards to that, or if it's rubbing. So if it's, um, you know, on your uh, thighs, um, you know, in your groin, it could be rubbing your underwear um, and really affecting your quality of life. So I would say discuss that with your primary care provider. And the last question online is, what is your opinion of Neil Saporn? <laughs> Good question. So this is a mixed uh, a lot of people feel differently about Neosporin. Now, Neosporin has its good points. It is a good topical, um, you know, antibiotic. So just like oral antibiotics, we build resistance. Topical antibi um, antibiotics, we also build resistance. So I recommend, you know, if it's a very superficial, which is like a very thin scrape or cut, um, you know, we want to clean it and cover it. Um, you know, if it's, yes. Uh, yes, I got a meow over here. So if it's a cat now, if it is a cat scratch, 
probably a Neosporin would be good. So I'm not against Neosporin, but we have to be careful with Neosporin because we can build resistance just like oral antibiotics with topical antibiotics too. Vaseline is a great one, and that is a great protector. So it helps to keep the wound bed moist, um, and that's what we look for. We don't want a dry wound bed because then it's not going to contract inward and the wound's not going to heal. So something like Vaseline is a fine protector, especially if you don't want things to stick. So we talked about that petroleum gauze to put down first and then to put a co you know, cover dressing on top so that it doesn't stick with so something such as a skin tear. Uh, so all of those kind of are the same. We have to be cautious with them. I know we used to use them all the time for everything, for any kind of cut, but we can build resistance to them. So if you start to see a wound with those signs and symptoms of infection, so hot, red, irritated, something like pus, you have to be careful. Always go see your primary care prov provider. You can start with something like a neosporin or like a polysporin and go see your primary care provider. But we have to be careful with too much use of a topical uh, antibiotic. Uh -huh. You have another online question. Uh -huh. uh, when should you use over-the-counter item called liquid skin? <laughs> liquid, liquid skin. skin. <laughs> so there's mixed opinions about liquid skin. I don't like liquid skin myself um, because in the midst of having a, an acute wound, and then you close it real quick with a skin glue, and that keeps the bacteria and things inside and underneath the wound. I've seen so many times infection um, from a skin glue because it was sealed and then you couldn't get to it to clean the wound. Now, surgeons will use that after laparoscopic procedures and that kind of thing, but they're in a sterile environment. So in that case, it is permitted. I don't like using a skin glue at home, honestly. I like to keep, you know, keep it clean, keep the wound bed clean and be able to access it so that you can monitor it. Good question. Yes. So soap and water are the best, you know, just to use at home. You know, a lot of people like to use all these different cleaning agents. Well, those cleaning agents have alcohol in them. So alcohol, what does that do? It's gonna dry out the wound bed. Soap and water, normal saline are two of my favorite things or sterile water. You can get that from Walgreens, Walmart, um, over the counter. Um, um, soap and water, normal saline or sterile water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are some of my favorites. Yes, back in the back. Hey, Tina. Yes. Yes, so for them, it's gonna be a petroleum-based product. So they want something that's gonna seal in. They want a barrier to keep the moisture that's there, there. Um, a lot of times we'll find that those patients, um, well, patients have neuropathy in their feet. So they're not looking at their feet. Um, I've seen before rocks stuck in the feet. They didn't know they were there. Um, different objects stuck in the feet, I recommend inspections all throughout the day, especially if you have a diagnosis of neuropathy because you may not know something is there. So inspecting, cleaning, just regular soap and water and a petroleum-based product to help seal in that moisture that you already have there. Great question. All right, any other questions? All right, I think that's it. Well, thank you all. Ah, I love it. Oh, well, I love being here and thank you guys so much. And I hope to be back next year. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>